to see you in stream. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So what I would like to do in this colloquium is give you some idea, some overview of the field of strongly correlated electron materials, and I'll give some introduction to that from the perspective of asking the question, to which extent are we beginning to be in a position that our insights, understandings, and ability to compute the properties of the materials is such that we can sort of contemplate now creating materials or being, having theory a little bit ahead of the experiments in this field. So <clears throat> the, to put things in perspective, since this is a colloquium, I think it's useful to ask the question of what sort of the role of theory in this field of condensed matter physics. And I'll start really from the very beginning, from the beginning of quantum mechanics uh, with Paul Dirac. And many people, we, condensed matter theorists don't like Dirac for this statement, uh, which he says, well, I mean, that was written when he finished his book on quantum mechanics. And then basically everything is quantum mechanics. And then the only difficulty is that the Schrodinger equation is very, very hard to solve. But in fact, this is really not a true quote. This is a partial quote. It's just half of the sentence. What, if you really read what Dirac says, he goes ahead and he says something else. He says that, in fact, that the field is way open, and he encourages people to find approximate methods of applying quantum mechanics in order to explain features of complex atomic systems. And he says, with too much computation, without too much computation in 1921. But, but <coughs> I think that this dictum of Dirac in 1921 is still true today. And it's one of the things which is actually guiding condensed matter physics 
in the sense that we are sort of trying to understand now much more complex things. We're trying to understand complex materials. And we try to do that from the perspective of really trying to understand it from basic quantum mechanics. Now, <laughs> usually this is sort of juxtaposed with some other dictums, uh, the dictum of my advisor, my PhD advisor, Phil Anderson, who in fact attacks Dirac for the first part of the quote, in which he stresses that, <coughs> in fact, condensed matter physics is sort of very rich because there are many things which happen at longer scales in complex systems which cannot really be described even as a matter of principle in terms of the constituents because things like superconductivity, you have some superconducting order parameter which acquires a life of its own. That's sort of the idea of emergence. And my belief is, that, and then of course the, the role of theory is to generate concepts, ideas, and find the new laws that govern physics and those long scales. So <clears throat> we have a little bit of a contradiction or different viewpoints. Uh, we have this first principles approach that Dirac is advocating that says, well, we have the equations and we should strive to see what we can derive from those equations. And then we have this Andersonian viewpoint which says, well, many things are actually not computable and we sort of have to generate the ideas and the new laws at long scales. And those, this, there's obvious tension between these two points of view. And that tension is part of the thing that makes our field of strongly correlated electrons a very rich field. And I think that both are right. Both Anderson and Dirac have very, very valid points. And the progress that I will summarize in the rest of my talk is ways of reconciling these two things. So I'll show you that over the last 20 years, we really advanced our ability to compute the properties of materials, really starting from the constituents, from the atomic positions. So really carrying out Dirac's program in solids, but we also have come up with some new understanding of how those strongly correlated materials work in an, an Andersonian view. So that's basically the big picture. And underlying this, there's a strong interplay of theory and experiment. So those are the main themes of my talk. There's a third ingredient, since I mentioned Dirac and Anderson, the great physicist, to understand condensed matter physics today, we also have to understand a little bit of politics, and that sort of explains also the third aspect of my talk, which is sort of the material design aspect. The materials are useful for society. And in the sort of the 21st century, people have realized that there's been theoretical progress in our ability to predict theory, the, the, the properties of materials. So <clears throat> there is this goal, uh, and I take this ideas of the materials genome as sort of a, a, a wish of society to harness our theoretical methods towards uh, and guiding them towards being able to predict properties of materials so that society can ultimately use them. So I think if you want to understand my talk, it comes really from these three things. And you'll, you'll see these elements and this de desire to get to the design part. So that's sort of the big picture. Now let's get to what we really know. And let's ask the question why there is such a material design initiative and why we really can contemplate the possibility of designing materials starting from first principles, uh, at least for weakly correlated electron systems. And the reason for that is that in the 20th century, we really understood solid state physics. We really understood simple materials. And the success is due to the fact that we have a very simple reference system for weakly correlated systems. What is a reference system? A reference system is something which is sufficiently simple that we can solve it completely, but at the same time is sufficiently complex 
to capture the real physics of the material. And it turns out that for weakly correlated systems, the free electron model in a periodic potential due to Sommerfeld and Bloch is a good reference system for understanding simple metals and semiconductors. And works very well for many, many materials, including things like silicon or simple metals. And that's really the thing that we mastered in the 20th century, starting from quantum mechanics. And that's in it's this mastery which allows us to think for the future about material design. So, sorry, what do you mean by very weakly correlated? I'll say that now. In this transparency, we'll answer this. Okay. So now I'll get a little bit more precise. What is this based on? It's based on actually two very, very fundamental ideas. One idea is due to Landau, and it's called the Fermi liquid principle. And the other idea is due to actually Hohenberg, Kohn, and Sham, and it goes under the name of the density functional theory. The <clears throat> and, and I'll define now what I mean by, by weakly correlated material. What Landau Fermi liquid theory says is that even though every material, all the electrons interact with the Coulomb interactions in the solid. So we start always from an interacting system. But there are cases that if we look at the material on a relatively low energy scale, the interactions we normalize essentially to zero. So if I look at the problem very close to the Fermi surface, then the, the weakly correlated materials are those for which the interactions really fade away at low energies. And the density functional theory gives us a prescription for computing the excitations in those materials. And it's an idea that you solve something like a Schrodinger-like equation in a self-consistent potential, something like Hartree-Fock, but a little bit more intelligent than Hartree-Fock. And then, by solving this reference system of one particle excitations, we get a good starting point for doing perturbation theory. In which sense? Well, we typically do just the first correction, which is the one interaction, one Feynman diagram in the screen Coulomb interactions, and that's really enough. This is sufficiently close to the Poinsham potential to be very, very close to the answer. This is called the GW method, and the reason why we believe that is because it's been done, it's been tested, and here, for example, is a famous plot of many, many, many semiconducting materials. This is the gap, which is the excitation, the energy that I need to excite an electron from the occupied states to unoccupied states. If one does the density functional theory, the gap is usually underestimated by some amount. When we put the first perturbative correction, then we fall on the experimental plot, more or less, and we get the right answer. So the definition of the weakly correlated systems are those which are perturbatively connected and computable in first order perturbation theory, starting from this very good reference, which is called the density functional theory. Did I answer the question? And the strongly correlated ones are, they gonna, are gonna be the ones for which this prescription fails miserably. So we have a single particle starting point, something like a Schrodinger-like equation for free particles in a periodic potential. Um, and then we have a first perturbative correction around it, and that gives us the right spectrum. And that's the reason why we can design semiconductors, because we have a predictive tool. Here there are no adjustable parameters. The only input here is actually the crystal potential. And then out of that comes out the gap. And the reason why it works is because Landau is hiding behind that and ensured us that the Coulomb interactions have renormalized to zero, and that's the thing which allows this to work. So this is very good, but it works. And then from this one can compute many other things. I mean, uh, and there's a whole industry based on that, and it's sort of very useful. And sometimes people say, well, <clears throat> but, and this is sort of a, quote by uh, Bernd Matthias, that theory has done nothing in terms of discovering materials. And this is empirically true, in the sense that the best theory that we have in solid state physics is called the BCS theory, and explains uh, everything about superconductivity. 
but that was in 1957. This is the TC of four non-mediated superconductors as a function of time. You see nothing happened with the discovery of the theory, in the sense that it sort of increases linearly with time <laughs> without any change. So, you were to go shooting away well, what, the, the, the idea of this material genome is that once we can actually really understand and compute, eventually we should accelerate the pace of discovery of materials. This definitely didn't happen with the BCS theory, but I think it's a very unfair criticism because what the BCS theory is, is really a low energy understanding of where superconductivity comes from, is not a prescription for relating a given material to a given superconducting temperature. So that was not meant to be. In fact, density functional theory had not been invented at that time. There was no way of linking structure and property. So it's fairly, fairly criticism. And in fact, this thing, and even when this was invented, nothing, we should not have expected any change because really it's only in the, in the last 10 years that the computational power and the computational implementations of the DFT framework came to the point that we can actually do something useful with them and run it on many, many materials. And now that this is implemented, we're beginning to reap the results. And actually, there's a very interesting paper in the archive of a few months ago, which actually reports now uh, very high temperature superconductivity, 180 Kelvin uh, in hydrogen sulfide under pressure. And if this is actually conf confirmed, that will be really the, the first case that a theory, in fact, suggested that material because this discovery was based on researching materials that were predicted by theorists. So I think that this makes perfect sense to me. Wasn't there a prediction that silicon under pressure would be superconducting, which was also discovered, which was a success? Yeah, there have been many predictions, but this is striking. I mean, we're talking about changing the course, uh, finding something big not uh, finding one more superconductor at very low temperature. If this is confirmed, it will be the first time that the experimentalists are researching materials that were suggested by theorists, and then among them, they find one that actually is very good. And it's happened as a result of all these developments. So I think that's sort of the way that science works, and this criticism is unfair. Uh, Matthias has a few rules uh, for how to find superconductors, which work well for the transition metals to look at materials which are not oxides, look at materials which are cubic, look at materials which have very high density of states, and stay away from theories. And it's something that <laughs> it persists even to the date. Okay, now we can all leave. You're a theorist, right? I'm a theorist, yes. <laughs> But again, this was good for searching and finding these materials, but it was not good for finding many other things. And the field of strongly correlated electrons really started to take off when people started to dis discover materials that were not like the ones that Matthias worked on. In particular, there was a big breakthrough with copper oxide superconductivity, which really broke the slope in the DC versus time. And more recently, there are some iron nictite materials, which are also high temperature superconductors. And depending on my time, I'll tell you a little bit about those. So <clears throat> those materials are not, don't fall within this framework of lambda Fermi liquid theory plus density functional theory plus perturbative corrections. And those are the strongly correlated materials. And there are materials that don't obey Matthias' rules, they don't obey the BCS theory, and there are probably new principles at work. And after the discovery of these materials, people started to pay a lot more attention to strongly correlated electrons. So I think that the birth of this field really was around 1986, 1987, where these discoveries were being made, and persist till today. So it's a fairly old field. And we are now finding, finally, some quantitative tools for treating these materials, and that's what my talk will be about. So to summarize, the strongly correlated electron systems, the, 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 uh, the definition I'm giving you, are those where this standard model does not work. It results on big things, 
I told you about superconductivity to motivate a colloquium, but there are many other important things that these materials do. I mean, they're, they're good, they, they can have very large masses, which is called heavy fermion behavior. They have interesting thermoelectricity. They have very large magnetoresistance. Since they don't abide by the rules of the standard model, they are free to do many things that conventional materials don't do. And as I said, this, the definition is that really the Consham system that was the mainstay, that was a system of one electron-like equations that was the mainstay of the density functional theory, cannot possibly describe the spectroscopic properties of correlated materials because in a one particle equation it's not possible to capture the physics of the atom, the excitations that you have in an atom which is full of multiplets, it's full of things that you see experimentally and they are not there in the Consham system and they are not perturbatively connected to the Consham system and that's a point that was pointed out very early on by Mott. And for a long time <coughs> we felt that what was needed is just a new starting point, a new system which is simple enough that we can actually solve it completely but powerful enough that starting from that new reference system we can connect via some small perturbation to the real materials. So we are looking for a new reference system to describe the properties of strongly correlated materials and compute their properties. So let me sort of show you, give you some examples that indeed besides high temperature superconductivity correlated materials really do extraordinary things. And just one example of something that I always found striking is the violation of low energy sum rules. There is a sum rule in, in solid state physics that says that if you measure the optical absorption of the material and if you integrate it up to infinity, that thing has to be a constant. Now, <clears throat> here we're sort of integrating it up to some high energy scale and we call that the, number, the effective number of carriers. So in weakly correlated materials, this depends very weakly in temperature. In strongly correlated materials, that's not true. And here's some example. This is a material which undergoes a metal insulator transition. You measure this thing up to very high energies, up to 1 eV or up to 5 eV. And you see that as a function of temperature, this integral changes with temperature. So that's very, very unusual and it falls outside the, 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 model, the, the simple band theory models of solid state physics and it's sort of very difficult to explain with, with the Consham framework. Another example of why the strongly correlated systems are so interesting is because <coughs> they're extremely resistive. So here I just collected for you a few examples of strongly correlated materials, uh, ruthenates, vanadates, cooperates do the same thing. What I want to point out here is that if you measure the resistivity versus temperature, the resistivity of these systems at high temperatures far exceeds what's called the mott yoffer regel limit, which is around 100 microohm centimeters, which would be here. And the reason why this is so puzzling... Sorry, can, I, can you give yes. me a reference? Yes. What sort of normal material has 100 microohm centimeters? Well, I mean, uh, copper. Metal or plastic? Or well, if you, if, you, if you look at copper, it's one microohm centimeters at low temperatures. And let me explain qualitatively why this is so puzzling. The point is that the standard model is based on thinking of the electron as a wave in the solid. A wave has some wavelength. And then every now and then the wave, the, the wave gets scattered by some defect or by some collision effect and acquires a mean free path. Now, this picture makes sense when the mean free path is much longer than the wavelength. To get this very high resistance, the mean free path has to be smaller than the wavelength. And that doesn't make internal sense in terms of the model. So what I want to show, the, the reason why I show this is to show that it's not just a quantitative problem that perturbation theory doesn't work, but there are also qualitative issues in understanding these strongly correlated materials, that we cannot do that in terms of a single particle picture plus scattering events.
And I give you those two examples, violation of some rules and resistivities. But this is also true about many other transport coefficients. There are many, many other anomaly spectroscopies. I can talk for hours about the strongly correlated materials. I will not. I just want to give you a couple of examples of why this puzzles us from a qualitative perspective. OK. Now, how to make them? It's very simple. It's very easy to make a strongly correlated material. All we need to do is follow MOT and try to keep the electrons sufficiently far away from each other. So you just have to look in the periodic table where you have open shells. There are many places where the atom has an open shell, 4D, 3D, 5D, 4F, 5F. You have atoms with open shells. And you put the material in such a way that the atoms are sufficiently far apart. Typically, the way you do that is by putting them in cages or by layering them. So if you do that, let me give you an example. Let me run to, through the 3D transition metal series. Then we, we can have vanadium oxides. We can have what's called manganites. This one is particularly interesting because you have it in your pocket, your cell phone actually is made out of lithium cobalt oxide. Those are all very important materials. If you do it with copper, you, did, you, you get copper oxides. So it's not complicated to find strongly correlated materials. There are many, many, many. The thing that we don't know is how do we find the really interesting ones? There are zillions of possibilities of things that you can imagine combining these things, playing with the periodic table. but there's no a priori guidance which one is going to be the high temperature superconductor, which one will be useful for batteries. There's no good connection between structure and property and no guidance in which materials to look. And so far, this field has progressed by serendipity and the Dysonian approach, in the sense that good people find good things, partially because they have good intuition and then partially because of luck and partially because of following Edison, which means that they try many, many things. So I looked up what is serendipity, and this means luck, and then I, try, I looked at what is the Dysonian approach, and in fact it's not trial and error. The Dysonian approach is really doing everything that is possible. So it's an approach to innovation which in fact, the historical record indicates that what, uh, this is according to Wikipedia, Edison's approach was much more complex than trial and error. He made use of available theories and resorted to trial and error only when no theory was available. So I think that uh, Edison right now would be using the modern approaches in order to find materials. And this method has worked for us in the sense that we, there are many, many interesting problems that we have not solved, and there are many, many interesting things to be discovered, in particular these iron nictites. And here you see how serendipity and the Edisonian approach works. Once somebody finds something interesting, and these iron nictite materials were found because there was a well-funded group in Japan by Hideo Hosono, a solid-state chemist, who was looking for transparent conductors because for the MAC, in fact, you need to have a good screen, so you use transparent conductors. And then he found that the transparent conductors he was trying to synthesize were, in fact, high-temperature superconductors. So that's sort of how the discoveries are made. Once you make the discovery, then you start with the Edisonian thing of trial and error, and then the critical temperature increases very fast over a short period of time. But if it's a conductor, you wouldn't think it would be transparent necessarily. Well, what happens is that they have, they're, they're essentially, they were looking for semi-metals, so, so you have some through the peak at very low energies, but then you have a gap, and you can use that basically so that when you touch your screen, it charges. But you can still see through the screen. Light is at very high wavelengths, it has very high frequencies, so it doesn't matter that it conducts at very low frequencies. Okay, but I'm sort of a theorist. For me, the problem is how to describe the in-between, something which is not described by the band theory, is not described by the atomic limit, and we need for that non-perturbative techniques. So we needed then a reference system, we needed a mean field theory for this problem, it cannot be single particle-like, 
because it has to retain the ideas of atomic-like excitations, so Hartree-Fock didn't work. And then I will show you is dynamic amine field theory, which is sort of this article that was referred to in the introduction, and how I believe this provides the correct starting point for treating all the strongly correlated materials. So, what's sort of the idea of dynamic amine field theory? So, what we want to do is the same thing you do in any mean field theory. What do you do in a mean field theory? You want to go from a system with infinite number of degrees of freedom to just a single site problem in an effective field. So for the Ising model, you know how to do that. You start with the Ising model, you look at the spin, you replace the medium by an effective field. The problem is how to do that for a quantum model. So let's just take a simple model of electrons hopping on the lattice. You don't need to know what this model is, but it's called the Haber model with an on-site interaction U. If we want to reduce it to a single site, what we do is we start sort of with a lattice with quantum degrees of freedom on the lattice, and then we ask what's going on at the single site. At the single site we have an atom, and the atom is constantly changing its configuration. To change its configuration, we are replacing the rest of the electrons of the lattice by a reservoir. So that's the mean field mapping. Mathematically, this is called an impurity model, which has an atom, which is interacting with some bath, and there are some effective parameters, which are like this vice field, which will be determined in a subconsistent way. That's the key idea of dynamic mean field theory, and more sort of abstractly, we start from a lattice, we truncate the problem to an atom in a medium, but then we go from this atom in a medium and we embed the results of that calculation back in the lattice and we can get the observables such as the photoemission spectra or the Q and omega dependence of the susceptibility by computing things with this impurity model and embedding them to retrieve the full responses in the lattice. And this was actually generalized in 1997 to an electronic structure method. And now we sort of start with the full crystal. The only input really is the atomic positions. So the only thing that we need to know is where are, what type of atoms we have in the crystal and where do they sit. And then we map it on this impurity model. Then we embed the result back into the lattice and we compute the full Green's function of the problem. That's sort of the, 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 the flavor of dynamic amine field theory. I'm just giving you the vague idea so you know what we do. But the important thing is that now we have a link between the atomic positions and the properties of the system, whether it's the susceptibility or whether it's the photoemission spectra, and we can start answering the puzzles that I formulated before. Okay, so some sort of technical points. This gives us a new non-perturbative starting point. Now we are not starting from bands like in the density functional theory. We are starting from an atom in a medium. So it's a much better starting point for understanding materials. And now uh, we can access this bad metallic regime. We can study different order states, superconducting, magnetic. Uh, the other thing which is, I should point out is that this, solving these dynamic I mean field equations is quite complicated and there have been many, many advances over the last 10, 15 years which ha are making now this approach finally practical in the sense that solving an atom in a medium is much harder than solving the Schrodinger equation that you lear learn in quantum mechanics, but now we know how to do this problem exactly. And that's why we're now in a reasonable starting. We can actually also contemplate doing material design with correlated systems. Yes. So mean field works better in higher dimensions. Yes. So right now, are you just mainly applying it to three-dimensional materials, or you think you could also very well describe it? Okay, this is sort of an excellent question that I didn't have time uh, to describe because I didn't want to give a too technical discussion you know, of dynamic mean field theory, but I should say a few things. First of all, as you said, as you said correctly, the, more, the larger the coordination of the lattice, the more exact the method is. This becomes exact when the coordination is infinite. 
However, there are extensions, and that's sort of what I wrote here. Each material has, in fact, a minimal unit that contains the local physics of the problem. If you're, certain materials require two sites, some other materials require four sites. So what we're really doing for materials which require two sites or four sites is what's called a cluster extension of dynamic mean field theory, which is a generalization of the single site dynamic mean field theory to take into account for some short range correlations. So it's possible to even do two dimensional systems with this approach provided that you take bigger unit cells. The only thing for which this would not work is a quantum critical point with very highly non-Gaussian fluctuations. Even for a critical point which is Gaussian, this approach will describe it correctly. So that's sort of a, a little bit the, the technical answer to that. But the way I want to introduce that here is really as a compass in the space of materials. It's something that will help us now find our way in something that was very complicated 20 years ago. So now, in the remaining of the time, I will just show you some examples of how this works and how this enables us to understand real things. So this is an old problem. Mod transition in vanadium oxide. This is a material where if I just change the pressure a little bit, the resistivity goes, changes by a huge amount, goes from metal to insulator. It has here a critical endpoint, which is like a liquid gas type of endpoint. And it's been always a problem. The resistivity at very low temperatures is like the standard model, has T square resistivity. But if you look at it on a much broader scale, it's also the type of bad metal where the resistivity is very, very large. So that was one of the first motivations for developing the dynamic mean field theory. It was a very, very old problem. And what we were able to sort of show is A, if we do, if we analyze the phase diagram of uh, vanadium oxide, we can get pretty much a phase diagram like in the experiment. But we also noticed theoretically something quite interesting. When we change the temperature by a little bit, the spectral weight gets redistributed over a very, very broad energy scale. This was done with very primitive models very long ago, as soon as dynamic mean field theory was developed. And we predicted, in fact, that we would change the temperature in vanadium oxide by a small amount, by a few hundred degrees, and we would get a redistribution of the whole optical conductivity curve by a large amount. So that was sort of the prediction, and that's how the experiment looked like. And again, not perfect agreement. This was not ever meant to agree quantitatively with the experiment. That was before we made the method realistic. But the qualitative idea that you, you have this complete rearrangement of the states upon small variations of temperature. These changes in temperature are minute on an electron volt scale. An electron volt is like 10,000 degrees. So we're changing by a fraction of one electron volt the temperature by 1% of an electron volt. And we get changes in optics all the way up to one electron volt. So it's a surprising effect that came directly from the theory. And that was already that was sort of the first indication that this approach was a very reasonable approach for correlated materials. Now I would like to show you what we can do 20 years or 10 years afterwards with the modern methods. And uh, this is taken from a paper that we published uh, uh, in the last year, where we actually made a, an even more interesting prediction to the experimentalist. We were trying now to understand not just all the high frequency optics, but the DC resistivity. And you all know that through the formula that the, con the conductivity has a tau and has an amp. And <coughs> what we said is that the way that these materials behave is such that if we look at the tau star, this will behave like a Fermi liquid. But the reason why the resistivity looks so strange is because the M star is a strong function of temperature. That's why we called it a hidden Fermi liquid, because from the point of view of tau star, it looks like Fermi liquid, but from the point of view of the resistivity, it is not. 
And then what we suggested is that we can check if this is true or not by means of optics. Because if you measure the very low frequency optics, you can separately extract the scattering rate and you can extract this weight, which is what I call 1 over m star. Uh, so you, all you need to do is measure both real and imaginary part of the conductivity and if you can measure both with the lepsometry and take this limit when the frequency goes to zero you can measure these two things separately rather than just the product which is what you get in a static DC measurement and this is basically the comparison now this is our state-of-the-art methods we really do vanadium oxide we put the atoms we run anything everything and this is the main confirmation of the prediction because you see clearly that this mass does depend strongly on temperature it's not like in the standard band theory that you do your bands and the masses don't depend on temperature here the masses are strong functions of temperature furthermore the 1 or tau star has a t square dependence like we had asserted. So you see, now you start seeing the power of having something which is system specific, but at the same time looking for concepts, for ideas. And this idea of a hidden Fermi liquid, which is underlying all that, in the sense that the, the scattering rate is still proportional to t square plus constant, but where all the electronic structure, all the bands are strongly temperature dependent is something which allows us to understand the anomalous properties of this system. Okay, so I think I have like five minutes. Uh, I'd like to say, five, ten minutes? Yeah. I'd like to say something also about the iron nictites. And, uh, because the iron nictites, these materials that were discovered recently, were the first time really that we were able to test our methods in real time, in the sense that something new comes and finally we have some method for guiding ourselves in, in what's going on. So I'll just give you some highlights of what we were able to do. So the material was discovered by this fellow and was discovered uh, experimentally, but uh, I, I, and if now there are many, many materials which have the same structure, the same pattern, these iron nictite layers, but they have many, many, many different interlayer things. Okay, so what, were you, what, what did we do? As soon as the experiments came, within a couple of weeks of the experiment, we were able to actually run our calculations and see what, what, what they had. And we said a few things. First of all, we computed electron-phonon coupling and argued that the TC due to phonons was negligible, so this was an unconventional superconductor. And the other thing is we estimated those mass enhancements and we said that the masses relative to the band theory were enhanced by a factor of 3 to 5. So we pointed out already at the very beginning that the material was very correlated. And again, this is a first. Usually when a material is discovered, there's usually a band theory calculation. Now we can actually also do these correlated electron calculations and we can determine if the material is correlated or not or whether it's interesting and clearly this was a very interesting material so that's our orient us the other thing is well that was done 2008 and there was a lot of arguments in the community this is a very contentious community whether this is correlated or not etc but eventually experiments come in and one year later there were sufficiently good optical measurements uh, and the M star over M of this compound, this is the M star over M, one over M star was measured and it was around one third. So that's what we had said, a mass enhancement between three to five. So in that sense, these calculations were already telling us that we're on the right track. So that was sort of one type of prediction. The other thing that was very interesting is that we can actually vary the independently in the computer the various parameters and what we noticed is that the large enhancement of the mass was not due to mod Haber physics like in the vanadium oxide but to a completely new mechanism which is due to the Huns coupling on the iron and that's what we call these materials Huns metals this is the physical values of the parameters of the iron, uh, iron nictites and we discovered a crossover between a Fermi liquid at low temperatures 
and a very highly resistive state at high temperatures. And again, a few years later, now people can do good measurements on these iron nictites and see two things. First, the resistivity at low temperatures is very small. In fact, this resistivity is less than one microohm centimeters, it's better than copper. But at high temperatures, it's huge, it's like 400 microohm centimeters. So that's essentially this coherence in coherence crossover that we had predicted as the materials were discovered. So once again, I think that it allows us to demonstrate that this method now is working really well. The other thing we can do is now we have lots of compounds, we can scan through them, and again, this only became feasible in the last year that we can do calculations not for one compound, but for many, many of those. And we can try to see what governs the mass enhancement, what is the systematics, what's really important, and understand what sort of the chemical handle that allows us to vary them. Star, in this case, is the iron nictite height. Is this, uh, as we sort of change the nictogen height, we can get masses which are as small as one or as large as seven. The average is actually three. Yes? Oh, because I, 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 I mean, why is it more weakly? It looks like it's apparently more weakly interacting at lower temperatures. Well, I mean, the, again, these materials are Fermi liquids at low temperatures. Well, uh, we need. I need to give you a different lecture on the theory of Huns metals, and if we look at the impurity model, uh, then it turns out that this impurity model with a large Huns coupling in fact forms a Fermi liquid at extremely low temperatures and therefore it does behave like a Fermi liquid but then as we raise the temperature it goes incoherent at an extremely very low temperature scale. So it's like condo physics but with a very different twist due to the Huns rule coupling. Okay, so I think that I, I, I've given you some idea. I just want to show you one more thing. I will skip something on the superconductivity of this, and I just want to show you one more thing that I'm, I sort of I was quite I, I felt quite good about this. Uh, in 2009, when these materials were discovered, we were trying to find our own material. So there was we were trying to find something that didn't exist, that had not been made, and we came across the idea of making a 112 family. So rather than one to two, which already exist, we sort of started to propose a few compounds and started to look at their properties. And we noticed something very interesting. We noticed that these are like ordinary iron nictite superconductors, but the spacer layer is actually metallic. And we were forced to write the paper in PRB, rejected from PRL, and we were forced to write a hypothetical compound by the editors because <laughs> the compound didn't exist, but I don't like the term hypothetical compound because it suggests that it does not exist. And a few years later, in fact, the compound did exist in that family, in the 112 family. It's a 43 Kelvin superconductor. And now I was talking to Andrew about the DMREF a chemist at uh, UCLA has been studying this material more precisely. The theory was not perfect in the sense that there was a slight distortion of this structure. So it was not a perfect uh, square net in the metallic layer. It tends to form zigzag chains, so it does distort. But the prediction of the metallic layers was completely correct, and we identify a Fermi surface that comes from those metallic layers. So at the end of the day, I, I'm sort of quite encouraged, I mean, after all these years of work, finally we can think of a compound, tell what the properties will be, and, well, theory is still not perfect, but remember the graph I showed you at the beginning, how long it, take, it took density functional theory to get there, I think we're doing pretty well. So now my conclusion, I hope I convinced you that we made some progress. Over 25 years, uh, we now, I think, we are beginning to learn how to compute and even predict properties of oxides. We're still a long way to reach maturity, like density functional theory did for weakly correlated systems, but there is a learning curve. 
and I think we're over the hump in the, in the learning curve. And I think there are very interesting opportunities uh, for doing very interesting science in strong correlations. I give you two examples of Hunsness and Motness. And I think that now it's time for theory and experiment interaction in really to advance faster the pace of material discovery. And one of these DMREFs in which I'm participating is actually doing that. So, what's for the future? My feeling is right now, uh, I started with this material design and what are the perspectives in that. My point of view is that the current situation is reminiscent of the very early days of navigation. So it's when sort of Christopher Columbus was trying to find something and the thing he had was just a compass. Uh, what we sort of would like to have is something like a GPS because the, the space of all pos possible materials is very big. On the other hand, you know, I mean, even with this thing, Christopher Columbus managed to do some interesting discovery because he had, in some sense, the wrong theory. I mean, he had the wrong measurements of what the circumference of the Earth was. If he had really known how big the thing was, he probably would not have undertaken the, the trip he did. So I think we're exactly in this situation, and that's sort of a good place to stop, and thank you for your attention. Yeah. Thank you very much for that very interesting talk. Are there questions or comments? He has a sure question. In Christopher Columbus's time, somebody knew what the circumference of the Earth was. They had the wrong number. The knew what the circumference of the Earth They had the wrong number. They had the wrong number. They, they thought it was too small, and therefore he was not going to America, he was going to India. Yeah, right, yeah, right. But it's funny that he was so off, because people knew what this would come to. Well, there were two different theories. And in fact, the, the, the theory that he believed was actually incorrect. It's a very interesting, you can look it up in Wikipedia. In fact, he had to apply for a grant. To, 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 from, uh, he was denied the grant a couple of times. <laughs> he just got it the third time. It's like a, an NSF grant. Uh, but uh, some, I think it's a, so what, the message I'm trying to give you I think is a good direction to go. And I think we're, I'm sure we're going to find very interesting things, even if the navigation tools we have are somewhat imperfect. But we have something which is working reasonably well. So in conjunction with experiments, I think this is going to be a very exciting area in, in the next 10, 15 years. So that's sort of the message and the analogy I was trying to give. We went over this quickly. Do you also predict the superconducting ordering temperature? Well, that's sort of, uh, I, I skipped my, um, the part on the superconductivity. We are at the point we can still not reach mm -hmm. computationally. We would need probably a factor of three or four to go down to the scales where the superconducting transitions are beginning to take place. So in, in things like our nictites. But it's not, we're not up against an exponential barrier. So I think it's just going to be a matter of a few years until we can systematically go at that problem. So but, we're, but, but what I did, which I didn't show you, I had an interesting prediction of what is the symmetry of the order parameter iron nictites, but it's probably too technical and I can do it some other time where we can discuss in private. Okay. Yeah, hi. Do, do you really think it will only be a few years until we're able to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think so, because uh, again, now it's not a problem to do routine calculations around 100 or 200 Kelvin, it's just a question of going to 50, and nothing is exponential, it's not an, ex the algorithms are not facing an exponential barrier. In fact, dynamic mean field theory scale linearly with the size of the unit cell. So I, I think that the, I foresee in the next, next few years, for magnetism, we're already doing it. I mean, we can, we, can, we can calculate. For iron and nickel, in fact, I did that with uh, such a Liechtenstein about 10 years ago. We estimated the magnetic transition temperature of nickel and iron. Now, of course, that's very high. That's 1,000 or 800 Kelvin. But I think that basically we will get to 50 or 100 Kelvin very, very soon. OK.
So you'll be able to tell us the mechanisms that also once you can reach that, you can tell No, we can, we can even tell you now. I mean, in, in some sense, uh, the, the, the thing I was going to show you is in these iron nictites, uh, I would need to go a little bit more in the electronic structure, but we sort of made some non-trivial prediction. What is the structure of the order parameter? This, let me tell you sort of in words. The thing that, that, that is interesting about all these strongly correlated materials is that the pairing function now is, is a function of, ha, has some internal structure because it, now when we pair electrons in iron, it's not just pairing k and minus k, but there is an extra index, which is the orbital or the band. So, so if you want to think of making a wave function, it has structure. And we found very interesting structure in, in this thing because it's, uh, uh, the, we have three different orbitals and we have the phase of these orbitals can be positive or negative. So really there are three different possibilities. One is the thing that standard theory gives you that all the three orbitals carry the same phase. You can also have the D wave where you have one and minus one, but we find a third phase which I think is realized in some materials, which is 1, 1, and minus 1. So I think this degeneracy is already a non-trivial prediction about the superconducting state and the way that these iron nictites are using the orbitals. And that only became possible last year. We're still way above TC. What we're studying is we're studying sort of the linearized BCS or migdal elias equation at sufficiently high temperatures to see what's the leading eigenvector on which mode you're likely to condense. We can still not compute at which temperature it will happen. But that's already a non-trivial prediction. So again, I think it's just a question of time. Thank you very much for this interesting. Okay, thank you.